Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is Perry Nemiroff. Hey guys, so happy to be back in the captain's chair today. Adam, do your thing. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> this is the last thing I'm going to do today before my brain turns to Power Rangers mush. I swear I'm not going to hijack the sideboard. It won't be all Power Rangers, even though that's what I want it to be, because we got great topics today. So, Ashley, who's joining me? It's Morphin Time. Also, mm. here's John Schnapp. <laughs> Delicious. You gonna share any of those? <laughs> also, here's nope. Jeremy John. You are the sweatiest of sweaties. We gotta fight the monster. Tiger Zord! <laughs> Green Ranger, he's the best. Also, here is Mark Ellis. Uh, you did the classic guy with a beard move where you bit into a cracker yeah. and a little bit got into the. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's never supposed to happen that way. Uh, quick shout out to all the uh, Collider and Schmoes fans that were at Doug Loves Movies Live last night in Hollywood. I had a blast with y'all and I ate two whole Cadbury eggs on stage. They are not as easy as I remember. <laughs> Well, Ooh, they are tough. now I want food. But instead, Ashley, what's our first story? According to a report from Variety, six <clears throat> of the seven biggest Hollywood studios are continuing to push to offer movies at home weeks after their theatrical debuts with a new $30 price rental on the table. Of the major studios, Fox and Warner Brothers are showing the most flexibility about the release window, with Fox and even Universal both feeling that the $50 price tag is too steep a price to ask consumers to pay. Lionsgate, Paramount, and Sony have also been in discussions with AMC, Regal, and Cineplex about a possible home video deal, though details are still developing. Of all the studios, however, Disney is the only one not interested in shortening the release window because their slates include animated Pixar, Marvel, and Star Wars, which all tend to have long runs in theaters. Pair me, pair me. It is official. The cat is out of the bag, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Stamp of approval. All right. Perry, <laughs> what do you think? Of? You guys just going to answer everything together now? I don't even yeah. know who she threw it to. <laughs> Uh, one of you. Oh, my God. Harry, this one's for you. Wow, well, I couldn't have planned that any better. Um, well, in all seriousness, this is a pretty interesting and major story. <laughs> really, we knew that this kind of stuff was going to happen. This isn't a new story by any means. This is something that everybody's been talking about for years. These kinds of plans have been trying to be worked out for so long. And... It's inevitable with the rise of streaming services and how dependent we all are on them, and especially with younger generations. I mean, before we know it, younger generations are going to be the large majority of the movie-going population. They need their movies whenever they want, wherever they want, and these are the ways to do it and the ways to make money. What fascinates me most about this story is the point where it says, um, because of certain laws... All the studios aren't allowed to come together and say, you know, it'll be best for, let's make this all neat and organized. It'll be best for everybody if we have this window for this price. Everyone has to negotiate on their own with the different theater change. So that means we're probably going to end up in a different situation with every single studio. And when you're comparing all these major motion pictures that are warring at the box office, that's kind of going to change the game with, with box office competition going forward. So, you know, this, this one article mentioned that no deal is imminent. So it's not like we're going to come back next week with a report saying this is how it's going to go from here on out. But these are going to be ongoing negotiations. And one day they are going to come to an end and we're going to get major releases on streaming services, on VOD. So, Ellis, what do you think? Well, uh, pair me. It's nice for you guys because you each only have to pay $15 per movie. And it's great news for one Dennis Zen because I, I have dropped your ticket price. When you come over to my apartment, it's not going to cost you as much money. You're welcome. $10 for Dennis, 5 for everybody else. Um, I think that uh, this is... It's just weird to be in this day and age, isn't it? It's like you never thought that you that you would see a time when you can get new release first run movies in your home that quickly, which by the way, that's one of the greatest graphics that Ray has ever put together. Yeah. That is fantastic. A nice Norman Rockwell family watching a guy put claws through somebody's head. <laughs> I am all for this. I really am. I understand the apprehension by studios, particularly Disney, because their movies make the most money at the box office, and people want to go see those in theaters up to two months after their initial release. So studios can want to cash in on this. Theater chains should read this and be rightfully so very 
nervous. But I wonder if that actually is going to boost box office for the first couple weeks because you better see this movie in theaters or else it's not going to, it's not going to be around that long. Because theater chains, they're just going to keep putting <coughs> newer movies on more screens. Because if you can go see Logan at home now, why would you still have it in three theaters when maybe you put it in one theater and you make room for other films? One of the most interesting points in this that I actually really liked was that maybe the rule should be when a movie dips below a certain amount of screens, that's when it should enter this kind of this kind of realm. Schnepp, one, what do you think about this story? And two, how much are you going to charge Dennis if he wants to come watch a movie at your place? <laughs> Dennis, because I get a ride with him every morning, it's only three dollars and fifteen cents. <laughs> so plus a dollar for the bathroom. Well, a dollar for the bathroom, and and then an Ellis surcharge if he brings Alice is thirty eight dollars. So <laughs> wait, just, wait, just wait, how so it works. Now just how it works. Choke on your aspiration, son. Um, <laughs> sorry, it's from a conversation earlier. Ma Bell is why their 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 companies aren't allowed to you know, talk to each other. Otherwise you get this giant creature that's gonna overcharge all of us. So I think, you know, with what you're talking about, I can easily see in the next year or so, Disney releasing a Star Wars movie and then a month and a half later, releasing it for VOD for 50 bucks. While another company, it's like say Universal, releases theirs after 30 days and charges $20. Because Disney is, knows that like, look, we're, we've got the whole family wants to see it. They're gonna make a big night out of it. 50 bucks is a steal for not having to go to the theater. You know, I, I don't think it's going to really replace movies because people love to go see these giant, big blockbuster films in giant theaters. But, you know, if you have your own giant home theater, then maybe you'll want to rock that and invite all of us. So, you know. Jeremy, what do you got? Yeah, it's a, uh, there have been companies, uh, theater companies, theater chains, and studios that have been in this war before, right? Pretty recently, I forgot the movie, but there was a movie where uh, they wanted to release it digitally. It, what, was, do you remember? it was Scout's Guide to the Zombie Apocalypse yes. and also Paranormal Activity Ghost Dimension. That's why I couldn't see it. I think it was Regal Cinemas was like, well, screw you. We're not going to show your movie. And so movie theaters do have that. It's essentially the same as any strike where it's like, oh, you're going to do that to us? Well, we don't have to show your movie. Then you're going to lose money. And and that's where it's really dipped off, and we, we never really heard about it uh, since then. But if more studios are getting behind this, then that will... I mean, movie theaters can't just be like, well, we're not going to show any of your films. Disney'd be fine with that. They're like, well, I guess all those screens go to Star Wars, Marvel, what Disney animations, whatever you want to do. Um, but I think uh, Roger Ebert a while ago hypothesized this coming one day. He was like, one day, movie, like home entertainment will be where movies are released. People will go to the theaters for a different experience. It'll be more old school. It'll have the balconies, the red curtains. You know, it'll, it'll be the whole works. With digital uh, medium, you can do a lot more than just show movies. So I wonder if, you know, imagine a theater that's like, we're going to stream all of the, the Stranger Things 2. You know, for like 10 hours, you can watch Stranger Things 2. I don't know, a lot of people would probably pay for that. So maybe that's where they'll make their money if they could work something out with streaming services. Who knows? But uh, yeah, it is a, it is a nerve-wracking thing for movie theater companies, I would think. And as someone who likes going to the theater, th there's nothing you can't watch. You feel like you feel like that family right there with the shittiest resolution television ever <laughs> conceived by man <laughs> watching Logan. It's I, I like going to a theater. I was actually in uh, in Washington when I got my house. One of my things was like I want a theater room mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I could still have that. And uh, but not everyone does that, you know. So there will still be people who go to movie theaters. Uh, not as many as who people who would be okay staying home and just watching it 30 days later. Um, but it's a uh, it, it's a very it's it's a nerve wracking change of time. But I feel like this is the inevitable outcome. We would always end here. So we'll see what happens. I hope theaters stick around because hey, that was always my escape in high school. But high you're right. I mean, fun. home theater technology has improved to the point yeah. where it's also cost effective for families to actually get a giant TV that's great resolution. You can get a 4K TV. It's no longer the richest kid with the leather jacket on the block now that can watch this kind of stuff. Everybody has access, or most people have access, to a nice home theater experience that is not obviously as big as going to see a movie. But if you can stay home, I like staying home a lot. If I I am like working at AMC or Regal. I'm not panicking just yet, but this story makes me raise an eyebrow, and I'm going to be very nice to the good people at Disney and do whatever they want because that's the last shoe to drop. I, I can see Disney offering their own box at home, like the Disney box where you can get Pixar movies and Star Wars movies separate. Why would Disney want to pair up with Universal and Fox when they don't 
have to. Because even if all these other companies are like, yeah, you can stream our movies right away, Disney's like, well, yeah, but you're not making the Avengers. It's not like Paramount is suddenly going to make Beauty and the Beast. You know, Disney has the rights to all these properties that people want to go see. So we're still going to be going to the theater for a long time. We're not choking on our own ambition just yet. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Ashley, what's our second story? Well, while Disney Pictures, Beauty and the Beast just broke the March box office according, or box office record with a <laughs> $174.8 million opening and will soon cross the $400 million global box office. Naturally, fans are wondering if that could mean a sequel is on the way. According to a new Deadline interview with president of production, Sean Bailey, a sequel is not in the cards. Speaking about the fact Bailey did state that Disney is willing to explore possible spin-offs and prequel scenarios for Beauty and the Beast in the future, but no concrete plans have been reached at this time. Jeremy, thoughts on a possible Beauty and the Beast prequel or spin-off? That picture just looks like the worst date ever. <laughs> like, you know, like the beast just looks like that douchey boyfriend. He's got his triangle beard. He's like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, I'll do the face. <laughs> hey, isn't isn't this a nice flower? He's like, yeah, it's all right, I guess. Yeah, you know, yeah, the flower, he, whatever. He looks like Belle does not look like her picture on Farmers Only. You know, like, <laughs> this is not what I signed up for. Yeah, right. It's like, uh, <laughs> unsubscribe. That's no, actually uh, what the Beauty and the Beast sequel is about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and on that note, I, uh, I don't like, you know, Beauty and the well, what is it? What, what is it gonna? We, we were joking about the title beforehand. Yeah. What were some of the? What was you some said of the Lord of the Kings, uh, Return it, of the Beast, Return uh, of the Beast, or some nonsense? Like, what is yeah. it gonna? No, it's like Beauty and the Beast happened. We got the backstory at the beginning <laughs> yeah. of the live action Beauty and the Beast, which I thought was a cool take on Beauty and the Beast because in the animation you just kind of got it through uh, imagery and, and windows. Right. In this one, you see what happened. I don't need to see. The Beast when he was at, in, in the prime of his indulgent douche, douchehood. <laughs> and I don't need to see now with their kids in the continuing adventures of I think Beauty and the Beast is fine where it is. It's like, stop this prequel sequel nonsense. Yeah, this is just getting a big fat no from me and I really liked Beauty and the Beast mm -hmm. but this is the perfect example of needing to sit down and say, yes, we're going to make a lot of money if we make more but no, because we are going to ruin one of our most beloved classics of all time. Right. Why would they ever do a prequel or any type of spinoff whatsoever? Because Money. There's, <laughs> I don't like that reason. Man. And there's absolute, there's no way that they could make one of these movies, regardless of like what idea they go with, without it somewhat affecting what we know and love, whether it's the live action Beauty and the Beast or the classic animation. Anything that happens in that is going to affect the one we already have. I think this is a crazy idea. My least favorite of all the, the live action Disney movies was Maleficent, and it's because it was a, a silly story. It was stupid. I didn't like it, and that's what I think this is going to be. Schnapp, what do you think? Before the Beast. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to skip that. I don't know what they'd call it. Uh, beast 4. Yeah, Beast 4. Uh, <laughs> beast 4. Yeah, I, I think it's a money grab. You know, Disney used to do this kind of thing where they would, like, make a movie and then they rele release like a cheaper, quicker version just straight to DVD. Like Aladdin's Pals Gimli or whatever, you know, it's like <laughs> Like, there'd be a weird <laughs> sequel that would show up, like, at the convenience store. It's like, huh, that's weird. Lion King 2, Simba's Pride. Yeah, exactly. All those would be like, oh, we got to beat the, you know, because other people would be making ripoffs of Disney, so they just caught on. I don't know. I'm not into it. Yeah. I mean, this, this story, though, it's also important to point out. It's not like there's some, you know, super long quote about how, oh, we're really diving into thinking about prequel plans. This is kind of just like an offhand comment. So there's no confirmation whether or not they're actually actively developing something like this right now. But then again, I wouldn't be surprised if it was on their minds. Ellis, what do you think? I think it's on their minds, and I wouldn't begrudge Disney for shelling out $500 for some fancy catering for an all-nighter at the office where a bunch of smart people who love writing fairy tales get into a room, and they they ideate. They, they try to think about what can we do with this property. And I wouldn't be surprised if at 6 a.m. they're like, you know what? You don't mess with Happily Ever After. You really don't. Because there's no story that I feel like is worry, worthy of a big screen adaptation with these characters that we haven't already told. I mean, you could have whoever put the curse on the beast <coughs> go around and put curses on other beasts but we would probably get the exact same thing. And it's not like you can have Belle and the, the prince like show up and be like, oh, we're going to fight the beat. Like, <laughs> there's, there, there's no way in my mind to do it. I would love for us, though, to sit around and like, let's, let's kick around an idea 
for like an hour and see if we can come up with something that we think might be a good idea. Sure. For It's got to take place in the Beauty and the Beast universe, obviously, and we have to have a few of the characters from the movie. Now, I will say this. If you want to animate something, like you guys were talking about The Return of Jafar or you know Simba's Pride or what, something like that, that would be fun. Like I like the characters in the castle. I like to see more of their backstory, sure. but I don't think it's like, oh, now we're going to tell a story about the clock. And that's going to be our big screen adaptation. This doesn't feel like the big Disney opener to me that they would want. What about you, Ashley? Any any strong um, feelings about this? The Haters Corner sells this so hard that one half of us actually left. But I stayed to represent <laughs> us. This is a huge, huge sell for the both of us. The reason why this did so well is because it holds like a special place in our hearts from something that we are familiar with. So... I mean, adding to the story, I don't really see how that can benefit because in the movie, we actually see glimpses into their past as is. So what you go with that, I have no idea. Like what, the prince's um, hard life with his rich life and the hot girls that want him? What is a prequel going to be about with his life? We already get to see what Belle's, Belle's life was like before. And as for spinoff, I don't really know what, I mean, what character would it be? Belle, Beast? I think the whole movie should just be a prequel or a spinoff about the footstool. What's the the puppy footstool? Oh my name? gosh, the yep. footstool is really and cute. And just though. Told, told from his perspective as he makes his way through the castle. There, I've got your idea. Don't make it. Live action and Rat will play the footstool. Yeah, I didn't hear the first part of what you said. Live action and Rat will play the footstool. Rat's like, yeah, yeah, sure. Would you guys be into like a shared universe though? Like, like, like where there's like the other Disney princesses factor in because I think that there's hints entangled and maybe frozen where it's like those worlds overlap a little bit. Do you care about that at all? Because I personally don't need to see every universe that is set up connected yeah. the way the Avengers are but it, it's it, I, maybe that's what they're they're going to think about is what if Cinderella stumbles upon this village and they have an adventure Ellis, together. Mark, Ellis, I'm pretty sure so. One, two, three. About three topics yeah. down. Yeah. I feel like that. we're going to talk yeah. about it's that. It's called so Princesses. We'll get back to you on that. <laughs> yeah. All right. But that was a great segue <laughs> yeah. in the future. Yeah. Look, I, just I, because, I, I just because my toss. mind works three topics ahead of y'all doesn't mean I should be challenged do, do not choke <laughs> on your future aspirations. On that note, I think it's about time to move into buy or sell. <laughs> Ashley, what's our first topic there? In an exclusive interview with Collider's own Aubrey Page, <clears throat> Woody Harrelson was chatting about his recent role in the Daniel Close <coughs> adaptation entitled Wilson when the conversation naturally turned to his role in the upcoming Star Wars spinoff centered around young Han Solo. <laughs> Harrelson spoke of the positive vibes he's feeling about the film's directors, Phil Lord and Chris Miller, while also hinting that his movie might be the best Star Wars yet. Yet. <clears throat> They're great. You know, any movie's only as good as the directors, or in this case, directors. And so I have a suspicion because if you look at the whole, all the movies, the backlog of every one of these movies, there's a lot of great stuff. But one might not be as good with the writing in this, or the acting in that, or the directing in that. This has great actors, great directors, great script, and I really feel like we're gonna make the best one. Mark Byers sell the Han Solo movie's chances at being the best Star Wars movie. Uh, you know, I Actually, I think I'd rather talk about Deadpool 3 and X-Force if we can just skip ahead to that. <laughs> um, if you're asking me about Star Wars, whether the Han Solo is going to be the best of all time, I would sell that because uh, it's never going to be the best movie to me, <laughs> like personally. And that's me being an old curmudgeon because this movie or The Force Awakens or even The Last Jedi can't mean as much to me as Star Wars, A New Hope, Empire, and Return of the Jedi did. Having said that, maybe The Last Jedi will be. But a Han Solo spinoff movie, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I agree with what Woody's saying, is that they have a fantastic team of directors. The cast is awesome. The writers are top-notch, and they know how to write, particularly one of them, in the Star Wars universe. So I'm very excited for a Han Solo movie. Just the fact that I'm getting excited to this level about a Han Solo spinoff prequel means that this is a great team making this movie. Because initially, when it was announced, I and I think a lot of other people were thinking... <laughs> Really? That's how are we gonna do? We don't even have Harrison Ford's not gonna play. This makes me nervous. All of a sudden, now people are starting to be a Twitter about what this could provide. This might not be the only Han Solo standalone movie we get. We'll have to wait and see. But Perry, is it gonna be the best one ever? I know. Uh, yeah, Jeremy, what do you think about this? Uh, yeah, I, I feel I'm with you. I, well, I'm the wrong person to ask because uh, best or perfect is linked to nostalgia, which is linked to childhood, which you just can't objectively come over that. It's just like, I, I love Star Wars, and that just is what it is. Even Empire Strikes Back is one of the greatest movies of all time, in my opinion, and it has 
definite flaws where the Empire's like, we found the rebel base. Let's put these big walking walkers about seven miles out th so they can see us coming. It makes zero sense to me on Hoth the way they did that. Well, they had to get gas. Yeah, the exactly. Gas yeah, there's a, there's a fuel station right down there. Some really cold guys like, yeah, sure, just fill it up. You don't even have to pay me. Uh, but, it, you know, it, it, so whether or not it's going to be the most technically perfect, don't know. Has a fair shot whether or not it's going to be the best. I think there is a kid who's going to be born this year who will grow up with this movie who could, in about 30 years, say, yes, this Han Solo movie is the best Star Wars movie of all time because it's his nostalgic link to his childhood. For me, no. But looking forward to it, do I necessarily need to see a uh, Han Solo backstory? No, but we're in that world, so interesting. Yeah, I'm going to buy this just because at this point, obviously every single Star Wars movie they make, yeah, I want it to strive to be the best. Do I think it actually will turn out to be the best? Considering how much I love particular original movies, probably not. But I do love the bits that he said about uh, Phil Lord and Chris Miller. Did I reverse their names? I said it right, right? I yep. always reverse nope. their first names. For yeah. some Miller reason. And Lord, you never get but anyway, Lord Miller. Lord those Miller. are those are two excellent people to have at the helm, and really, that's what they're doing with every single Star Wars movie right now, and that's why I have so much faith in every single one. They've got great cast, and they've got great folks in the director's chair, and I think that can make all the difference on this. I've been excited about a Han Solo spinoff since day one, so I really have high hopes for this. Schnapp, what do you think? Uh, yeah, you know, it's interesting thing for him to say without us having seen any of the film, without him having seen a film that this is going to be the best one. So, I mean, I'm sure as a cast member of this new Star Wars film, he's really excited and he's surrounded by great talent, but that's, you can't, you can't just go around saying, oh, it's going to be the best one without even seeing a rough cut. I mean, I'm sure he's excited that he feels it's the best one, but I absolutely do not feel that way at all. Um, I think it's a great idea to do a Han Solo prequel. I think getting Arlen Zeingrengreit block or whatever his name is. I what's his name? That's it. That's uh, actually yeah, all right. Yeah, I don't know how to say his yeah. name. Uh, but the guy from uh, the other movies, Alden yeah. Ehrenreich. Thank you. <laughs> what Perry said. He's got a hard name to say. Um, but uh, yeah, you know what? I can't buy that comment because I haven't seen the film yet. So I'm sure it's good. Is it going to be the best one, especially to oldies like me, where I love Empire and Star Wars, and you know all the rest are just non-comparable? No. So this is also like a teeny tiny little bit that he said at the end of a much longer quote. I mean, it's I really feel like we're going to make the best one. I don't think he specifically meant we're going to make one that's better than any other Star right. Wars movie that came out. It's just, yeah. I kind of read it originally as you know we're going to make the best one we can possibly make, totally. and if that that was word for word his statement. I would buy this 100%. And if we didn't bend it and twist it to our own ways, I would buy it as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. Headlines. <laughs> but I want somebody to say this. Like, I, I, I want somebody involved with this movie to say it. I, I would not want somebody to come out and be like, we're going to make a Star Wars movie. We don't think it's going to be that good. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. like, like, we're aiming for an Attack of the Clones level. No, I want oh. you to say it's going to be the best Star Wars movie of all time. There's just a weird thing around this movie that is so positive. It's this energy that just radiates off when I read a story, when I see a picture with all of them in the cockpit together. It's just like there's a lot of good vibes right now. It's like the Force is real. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind operating, like, thinking that's, that is true. Yeah. Okay. I, I took one census report in my life, and they asked me what my religion was, and I wrote the Force. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ashley, what's our next buy or sell? In a recent interview with io9 to promote a new Ghostbusters VR experience, original Ghostbusters director Ivan Reitman revealed that even though the Ghostbusters reboot didn't hit it big with audiences and critics, plans are still on for another movie and shared universe of movies in the future, starting with an animated movie. Speaking about the plan, Reitman said, we jumped into an animated film after the last movie, and we are developing live-action films. I want to bring all these stories together as a universe. That makes sense within itself. Part of my job right now is to do that. Schnapp, buy or sell more movies in the Ghostbusters universe. Yeah, um, you know, I, I guess I could buy it, you know. I, I'm not that excited about it. I feel like the Ghostbusters movie that they made was okay. It was fun. It just wasn't great. So it didn't live up to the, whatever the hype would be. I mean, I think it was overhyped, but I, I thought all, all the, the, the female cast were great. Um, I'd like to see a sequel with those ladies as Ghostbusters 2. I don't need to see another alternate universe of Ghostbusters. I mean, I know that they're trying to develop an entire Ghostbusters you know, world with all these different kind of shared universe things. I wonder about the animated movie. What is that going to be like? When is it going to come out? So, I mean... I'm just going to hold judgment on Ghostbusters until I actually hear about, oh, Ghostbusters 2 with those 
original gals is in production. I think that's the probably the smarter way to go than to try to now an alternate universe with Channing Tatum mm -hmm. and you know whatever. It's like yeah, I think I have to soft buy this for that exact reason. I did like the Ghostbusters that came out last mm -hmm. year, I, maybe a little more than most, and I liked all four leads. I thought they were great. I don't think the movie was as good as it could be, and in this interview, Ivan Reitman even points out, I think part of the problem is that we spent too much money on it, but you know, then again, you spend more money on it so that a director like Paul Feig can play around. I don't really know what went on behind the scenes. I'm just trying to read into this a little, but it's hard to get really excited about anything when he's painting such a broad picture. Because right. at this point, I, wa I didn't love the last Ghostbusters movie enough to say, I want more of anything I can get. However, if he said, we're going to specifically make an animated film and it's going to be this style of animation with these characters, then I could get a little more excited at this point. But you know what? Right now, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. Ghostbusters is great source material. There's a lot you can do with it. And I just hope that they kind of steer the ship in the right direction at this point. Jeremy, what do you think? Yeah, I think one of the bigger flaws in the last Ghostbusters movie was the fact that it wasn't a sequel. Like, it would have been more interesting if these Ghostbusters had happened. Everyone thought everything was fine. And then, oh, someone has to pick up the mantle of Ghostbusters, so mm. they do. They didn't do that, so they can't, kind of, they, they can't go back and do that. What would have been great is unless there's a Statue of Liberty sitting there in the middle of the street, that means the Ghostbusters 2 we got before never happened. I think that would be fine in the hearts and minds of a lot of people. Um, for me, the Ghostbusters movie was... I feel like it wasn't as good as people who wanted to love it wanted it to be, and it wasn't as bad as people who wanted to hate it. It was somewhere in some form of the middle somewhere for a lot of folks, uh, myself included. I, I was just like, yeah, it, it, you know, it happened. You know, I walked out of the movie thinking it happened. But uh, do I want to see more Ghostbusters? I'd be down with it if they handle it correctly. I just don't think from... Everything leading up to the release of the movie, I just don't think that Ghostbusters movie was handled correctly. What is correctly? I'm still figuring that out myself. My knee-jerk reaction is just to keep Ghostbusters in the pocket of nostalgia. Like, don't mess with it. You're just going to get a lot of venom if you even tweak with it whatsoever. Um, I'm, there was a Ghostbusters animation back in the day that everyone was fine with that I watched on Saturday mornings. There were three, two. The three. There were three? Yeah. I the remember one with the big gorilla, and then there was the real Ghostbusters. Yeah. That's right. Those are the two I remember. So uh, can they do it right with an animation? Absolutely. Are they going to? Time will tell. Alice? Uh, I'll soft buy it as well. I mean, it, it really is a complicated model, but the bottom line is I don't want to see this property that I love with all these great stories you could tell in any Ghostbusters universe go away because there's a lot of douchey internet trolls out there that attacked the last movie. I happen to like the 2016 version, and I do think it was the right way to tell that story is to totally reboot it, is as opposed to continue it. That might not be a popular opinion, and I might have to give Jeremy his jacket back after disagreeing with him, but I think <laughs> that that was the right way to do it. Now, whether they want to continue it, I think there's a lot of course correction you can do, because Perry, as you and Schnepp mentioned, the movie was overhyped and incredibly criticized. I think way over what it deserved to get. So if you don't put that kind of budget in, I mean, I can even watch the movie last year, and you could say, oh, we can cut all this and this and this out. We didn't need all that money. We didn't need all that hype. You could have made a small smaller Ghostbusters story and made it better. But what you're really looking to hook with an animated version of Ghostbusters is kids. I love Ghostbusters as a kid. As an adult, I appreciate the sense of humor really in all three movies. But as a kid, you want to see fun adventures with ghosts that aren't going to scare the crap out of you just a little bit. An animated movie could do that. Another adventure in the live action universe could do that. So I don't want to see Ghostbusters go away. I'm always going to be a fan. All right, now it's time for the topic Mark Ellis has been waiting for. <laughs> Ashley, what do we got? According to a report from the tracking board, Paradigm's David Boxerbaum and veteran literary manager Jake Wagner are shopping around a new movie entitled Princesses, a film being described as a female-driven Avengers-style movie featuring classic fairy tale princesses. Nir Paneri, who previously wrote and directed the low-budget sci-fi flick Extracted, wrote the script that is garnering a lot of attention from all the major studios. The script is is being sent to all buyers simultaneously, and Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man Tell No Tales director Joaquin Roning is attached to the package <coughs> for Disney. Perry, buyers sell an Avengers type movie featuring fairy tale princesses. Ugh, this is a <laughs> tough one. I kind of want to buy it because the idea of seeing all of my favorite Disney princesses come together in one movie sounds incredibly exciting. At the same time, if this project lands anywhere but Disney, 
I'll completely change my mind. I don't really understand how any studio can do this and do it well and it not be Disney. Because looking at this picture, I can tell you, you can already pluck out Brave. You could probably take out Frozen. Are you already making cuts Princess. like it's a baseball team? Well, well, think about what Disney owns, though. Oh, they, right, any right. other studio will not have access to those characters. And at this point, especially given younger audiences who now love Elsa and Anna, I don't think you can make a successful version of this movie without having rights to those characters. So I don't I think I'm actually leaning towards a sell now now that I'm actually talking about it. So you know what? I'm gonna sell this. Alice, what do you think? It's one of my favorite things on this show is when you get presented with a buy or sell topic and as you're talking about it, it happens to me all the time when I'm like, oh, this is a buy. Blah 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 sell. No, this is a horrible idea. This one in particular. I actually like it right now, but Perry, you make an excellent point. If this goes anywhere other than Disney, I'm going to have a lot of apprehension. I'm not saying don't make it, because here's what we have to remember. We need to stand back from what I brought up earlier in my expert foreshadowing, is that the Avengers is this huge shared universe that everybody takes so super seriously. Not every team up like this has to be this gigantic blockbuster franchise. We can make a fun movie with the Disney princesses teaming up to kick ass, and it doesn't have to be relatable to canon in any other thing. It's what Schnepp and I talk about a lot with a possible Wolverine Deadpool standalone movie that has nothing to do with any of the other X-Men films or Deadpool movies or Logan. We can just have fun with these two characters in a car fighting crime going across the United States. So I like the idea of this. And my, my I hit the live chat, as it sometimes do, I'm watching you. And Sky <laughs> Patterson made a great point where all the Disney princesses or a lot of them are from different like time periods. Yeah. Because, and like something like Beauty and the Beast, that clearly cements it at a certain <laughs> point in time, whereas Mulan took place a lot before then, and then you have 1600s, 1700s characters. But you can throw all that away if we just make a fun movie mm -hmm. where a bunch of Disney princesses get together and go on a mission. So I like the idea of this. I'm not going to throw it away offhand. I'm going to give it a buy. When you put it that way, it makes me think of something like Once Upon a Time, mm -hmm. where they don't have to have a straightforward version of these characters. And I, I you know, Once Upon a Time, clearly, do you watch it? You're making faces. Jeremy. I was going to mention Once Upon a Time. <laughs> well, that could be the way to go. What do you think, Jeremy? Well, uh, if Once Upon a Time taught me anything, Perry, now that you ask, is that you can actually do this. Um, I'm interested. I'm, I'm curious. It has my curiosity as to what they could do with this. I'm really curious to see where Nala from the upcoming line King movie fits into all of this. I want to see where that goes. Uh, but uh, is it doable? Yeah. Um, for all we know, Lion King could take place in the year 3074. We don't know it doesn't. It's just in the middle of nowhere and after, like you don't know when it takes place. The movie never actually addresses that. But you actually bring up a really good point about time. These people are definitely in different time frames, different time eras. Are they going to do something with time? And I also think you brought up a great... You've been thinking about this for about 30 minutes, I know. For about three <laughs> topics now. Uh, but uh, it's uh, they don't have to explain it if they just if everyone has fun with it, you know? So in that, they can do their own spin, they can do their own take, do it something like Once Upon a Time where there's some super land where they all come together, where the, the Beyonder from Spider-Man gets them all together and says, hey, do a mission or something. I'm curious enough to say, I'll buy it. Perry, I've never been more nervous about uh -oh. what John Schnepp is gonna say right now. I am on the edge of my seat. Well, Mark Ellis, princesses, keeper of the time crystals. <laughs> That's a, like throw yes. them all in some weird spaceship and they all get to sing their little stupid songs. From the Lion King. <laughs> Whatever. As long as it's animated. <clears throat> I, you know, I would like to see a live action one where they're all gritty and murdering people. Like, like yeah. the Expendables. Uh. Yeah. yeah. Just, I mean, you could have both of them. You know, you always have to have competing projects. Have the animated Disney one then have one for weirdo adults where they're murdering people. Is, does this report specifically state whether they want to go in an animated direction? Because I can totally see Disney on board with that. As far as a live-action princesses movie, I just don't see Disney touching no. that. I, I don't think that they would want to interfere with their other properties in that vein. But animated, which is primarily going to be geared and marketed towards kids that want to see all their princesses unite, I could see... A, 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 a factory of those Oh my god, this sells so out. many outfits. Every uh, princess mm -hmm. will be in a different time period if they yep. travel through each other's time periods. Every single year, like 40 sets of different princesses. <laughs> Bam, that's like $1,000 that every parent's going to pay. This report doesn't specify live action or animated, but given that the Pirates of the Caribbean guy is directing it, I kind of doubt it'd be animated. Right, right. Dude, here it is. Kingdom Hearts, 
Two words. Mm. Kingdom Hearts. Mm. That's how they're going to do it. It's going to be Kingdom Hearts. Is that Hearts. a uh, Harrison Ford movie? Uh, it's n almost. You're very close, Only Mark. It Harrison is an Ford adventure. Mickey Mouse. Random Hearts. <laughs> yeah. All right. On to the next topic, Ashley. What we got? As Deadpool 2 was gearing up to begin production, word broke that 20th Century Fox was already developing a Deadpool 3 said to be featuring some members of the mutant task force known as X-Force. This led fans to speculate that the long-in-development X-Force movie would actually be a third Deadpool movie. Speaking with Cinema Blend during the live press screening, writer Wright Reese confirmed that's not the case at all, and both films are being planned. I also think Deadpool 2 is working in an expansive way to, towards X-Force, which will really be more of an ensemble. But then that will allow us to do both an X-Force movie and a Deadpool 3. Schnett buy or sell X-Force and Deadpool 3 as two separate movies. I buy them as uh, separate movies. I want Joe Carnahan to do X-Force. I want Brad Pitt to pit play Cable. All these weird, dumb rumors that are going around. <laughs> I buy all of this stuff because I think... X-Force and Deadpool 2 and then followed by Deadpool 3 will keep that same kind of humor. I think X-Force won't be breaking the fourth wall as much as Deadpool. And I think Deadpool will be like more of an ancillary character who will still probably break the fourth wall, but it won't be that constant kind of, you know, he won't be the main focus of the film. So yeah, I, of course I'd buy that it's two separate films. Yeah, I'm going to buy it as well at this point. Although it's hard to, you know, wholeheartedly buy it until I see Deadpool 2. When I see what that movie gives me and where it leaves off, I'll have a better idea of whether we need another Deadpool movie before we get to X-Force or whatever, which way Perry, they're it's going to be the best these. one. Before it's even, yep. before you ever see it, it's the best one. I believe one. you, the, the best. I actually, I, I would believe it. I would believe that Deadpool 2 can top Deadpool, given who's involved in character-wise and talent-wise, because I love me some Deadpool. I want that movie now, but I'm going to buy this for now. Ellis, what do you think? A uh, huge buy for me. I mean, one of the great things that Deadpool did, one of the reasons why I think it was even considered to be a, an Academy Award-level film is because everything that we saw in Deadpool, you can extract bits and nuggets of that, and I want to see that movie. Like, I want to see more of Wade's backstory. I want to see more of the romantic relationship. I want to see more of the bar where T.J. Miller was. I want to see more of Deadpool interacting with other mutants, like what he did with Colossus and Negasonic Teenage Warhead. I want to see all of those movies separately, together. I don't care. There's so much in this universe we can explore, and it's not so tied in to what's going on with X-Men right now, whether they want to reboot that again after the next movie, or they want to keep having the current cast of mutants you know, continue to rock on. I think that X-Force would come after Deadpool 2, logically, and then you could go back to a standalone Deadpool 3. He's going to be breaking the fourth wall a ton, and I'm going to love every second of it. This is one of the most exciting properties out there right now, and I hope everybody else is getting on board. And Jeremy? Yeah, I, it's, it's a very simple thing from a studio standpoint and a fan standpoint. It's like, do you want two Deadpool movies and an X-Force movie, or do you want three Deadpool movies and an X-Force movie? If the Deadpool movies do well, if they make a lot of money, if fans love it, then it's, it's definitely the way to go. I'm with you. It's like, if Deadpool 2 is not so good, maybe they should... No, I'll give them a, I'll give them a third movie to, co to course correct the ship. So three Deadpool movies and an X-Force movie. More for everyone, more to love. I'm on board with that. All right, so that's it for Buy or Sell. Before we roll into Mailbag, I want to remind you that at the end of the show, we're going to take your live Twitter questions, so send them on over to the Collider Video Twitter account. Wendy's going to pick some good ones, and then we're going to answer them here on the show. Also, we have a couple plugs for you. Yesterday, we had a new Heroes that dropped, and there was also another Schmodown team match between the Schmoes and Top 10 with this guy right here. It was a hell of a match. No spoilers. It went down to the wire, though. It's, it's one of my favorite matches that we've ever played. And as always, we have a new episode of Awesome Tacular with this guy right here. Comes out every single Friday. There's links to that in the description section of this Movie Talk episode. We also have a whole bunch of sketches. If you haven't seen those sketches, you have to check them out. Dennis does a crazy good job directing them. Everyone is so good in them. Everyone's super funny. The ones that you can check out right now are the Ray's Ancestry video and the Ben Affleck press conference. They're up on the channel now, so please go watch those. And now it's time for Mailbag. Ashley, what's our question today? Suzanne writes, if the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers movie bombs at the box office, do you see still think they'll make a sequel seeing as the source material is still very popular. Would they even reboot if it bombs? Thanks for taking my questions. 
I feel like the only reason that Riley picked this question is because originally I was not supposed to be on the show today, <laughs> so I wouldn't take offense to it. But <laughs> it, it's a very valid question, though, because I was looking up some tracking information just to see what the numbers were going to be like this weekend. And, you know, I read one article, I believe it was from the L.A. Times, that was predicting 35 million, which for a movie of this scale that is looking to launch a major <laughs> franchise for Lionsgate, that's not the kind of number you would hope it to hit. Mm -hmm. But, you know, maybe the movie will have some legs. And also, it is going up against Life this week, which is some decent competition. But then there's Beauty and the Beast, which made a freaking killing last weekend. It's going to do really well again. It was like one of the questions we were answering last week, where it's like, do you think the Rotten Tomato score is going to affect it? No, it's not. And then also, I had pointed out that the cinema score is still going to be super high. And sure enough, I believe it has something like an A. That right there goes to predict that the weekend one to two drop off is not going to be very much so when you have a new franchise that is kind of in the middle just in terms of you know for folks who aren't hardcore fans of the original and didn't grow up watching and re-watching that show it, they're going to be caught in the middle and people have been skeptical so it's not ideal that it's going up against Beauty and the Beast this week. Ellis, what do you think? You know, Perry, before I was lobbing Cadbury eggs in my gullet last night, I saw Power Rangers, and I can tell you this, I think it's going to do well. I, I think the movie's going to do well, and it deserves to, because it's a fun movie. I didn't grow up loving Power Rangers like some other people who have been gushing about this movie since last year, but I think it's going to do very, very well at the <laughs> box office. I think it's going <laughs> to surpass those expectations of the LA Times. I don't really trust box office tracking, as you might know from recent and events, I think this could do well over $40 million opening weekend, and I'd be excited for it because I'd like to see more adventures told in this universe. It's hard to hear myself say that because I grew up not even, I, I was aware of Power Rangers, it was on at my house a lot from my little brother watching it, but I like, I was a Ninja Turtles guy, and then like right when Power Rangers came out, I was like, I'm gonna go outside and see what a sport and talking to girls feels like. It's just the natural evolution of growing up where I was like, I think I'm gonna leave these toys behind and try to do something else with my life. But Power Rangers is a fun time at the movies, man. I think it's gonna do well and I would encourage people to go out and see it in theaters. What do you think, Jeremy? Good well, box office predictions? Well, I, I, I'm pumped that Mark is predicting it's making $30 million this weekend. 40, uh, 40, well, I threw it up to 40. Yeah, that means 30. Um, oh. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, as someone who skipped his prom to play video games, yeah. I will say for every sister out there who watched Beauty and the Beast, there was that brother who was like, Power Rangers is on, move over. <laughs> I myself, I loved both, but I agree with you guys. It was a really fun time. I've been looking forward to this movie. Uh, the movie did what I wanted it to do. I had fun. I walked out. I was like, go, go, Power Rangers. I'm interested to see if uh, the first weekend, well, it's going up against Chips also. It's, you know, Beauty and the Beast is definitely That's the competition. That's why I didn't for even name yeah, Chips. Absolutely. Uh, Beauty and the Beast is the competition for Power Rangers. But I'm interested to see if next weekend more people like, hey, that word of mouth was good, as opposed to the current tomato meter, which might make people a little apprehensive to go in and see it. I'm saying it's worth checking out, so you should go check it out. What do you think, Schnapp? Well, I think regardless of the box office, they will make a sequel um, because they've already, you know, they're investing in this franchise. And I don't think it's going to make like $5 million. I think it'll make. Anywhere between 20 and 40, I think. And then the following weekend, it'll make 20 or 40. And then the following weekend, it'll probably make 15. So it'll eventually clear with wor worldwide. It'll make its money back. It'll, it'll, it, it could be a big hit or a medium hit. I don't think it's going to be a failure. So with that in mind, they've already got the new cast. They probably all signed on to do three or four movies. They've got the costumes. They've got Ivan Ooze or whoever else they've got designed. Now, remember, they had a big Power Rangers movie. And then... The second one that came out like 15 years ago was a box office bomb. So, you know, it doesn't really matter whether this film makes a ton of money. I think it's going to break even, if not make some money, and they're going to just go ahead and green light a sequel. Wouldn't it be really refreshing to see a film franchise like grow instead yeah. of come out really strong and then tank after that? Because I yes. feel like that's the typical trend. But <laughs> just to answer the other half of the question, I, if it does bomb and Lionsgate does wind up pulling the plug, they're not rebooting it, that's for yeah. sure. After they funneled all this time and resources into this version, I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah. But that's it for Mailbag. If you want one of your Mailbag questions answered on the show, all you got to do is send it on over to collidervideo at gmail.com. And then, of course, I forgot a plug from before, the one that I was purposely told not to forget. You guys are all <laughs> asking about that Death Note trailer. Well... Wendy and someone else who I don't know who Copster. it is. Copster. Copster. They did a trailer reaction, so that's going to be up on the channel soon. Some of us watched it here also, and yeah. thumbs yeah. way, way up. That was cool. 
All right. Twitter time. Wendy, what do we got? The first one comes from Javed Vilyev, who writes, Do you think bigger Netflix movies like The Irishman and Bright will ever get a worldwide release in theaters? I don't know. I'm kind of curious to see. Definitely. What Netflix mm-hmm. starts doing? Yeah, I mean they've Dutch already they've already <laughs> released a bunch of movies. You know, at the same time that they premiere it on Netflix, they release them on, in theaters. <laughs> Wide? Yeah. Well, I mean, not four thousand theaters, but yeah, a couple hundred here and there. I, I I love how the first thing we talked about is about how theaters are ultimately they might be going away and being replaced with digital medium. And I was like, well, is the digital medium going to uh, feed into the theaters? Don't know. It looks like digital's growing. Theaters might be shrinking in the decade to come. So we'll see what happens. I feel but like digital still... is going is growing, but the digital outlets need to kind of play that card right. now to give mm-hmm. themselves a firm place yep, because gonna we also don't want to be or at least they don't want to be in the position where eventually everything does go digital and all the studios just wind up overshadowing the Amazons and the Netflixes. So mm-hmm. they they need to put themselves in there as major players right now. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you still want you still want buzz, you still want an event. That's what this is for. It's not necessarily re- releasing a, a movie in a theater so you can earn a lot of money, but it is releasing a movie in a theater is another way to promote the fact you can watch this movie and if you don't live in LA or New York or Chicago where this movie is being released in theaters, don't worry, it's on Netflix at the same exact time. It's like when they do when HBO puts Game of Thrones, like the first couple episodes in a theater, the same night that it premieres that season. It's a fun event and people get excited to go to the theater but it also lets the rest of the world know in another medium, hey, there's this movie that you can check out right now. Well, they didn't do it at the same night. It was actually like six or seven months later but I still went and saw it in the theater. It was an incredible experience seeing Game of Thrones in a big theater. Beasts of No Nation was the one I was talking about with Idris mm-hmm. Elba that was premiered on Netflix and also in I don't know how many hundreds of theaters, maybe thousands, but Amazon is doing it. Every, every major streaming service has got their movies to compete with all the big movie companies. All right, you know what, Schnapp? It's going to cost you the Dennis Zen tag. Oh, come now. on. <laughs> <laughs> my place. You're in Dennis <laughs> Zen tag. Two dollars to use the bathroom. Damn. Oh, boy. Wow. All right, Wendy, what do we got next? <laughs> the next one comes from Fan of Films, who writes, what movie trilogy or franchise do you think you don't have to watch in order? Hmm. Well, Final Star Destination. Wars pretty easy. <laughs> it's pretty easy. Star Wars, they Final Destination. Get... <laughs> Final Destination. There's a good one. It's a good one. Yeah. You don't have. Yeah. Well, you don't. You know, you don't have to watch them in order. You all right. actually, all you need to know about the Final Destination film franchise is you have to watch one, two, three, and five. Four doesn't exist. <laughs> I would say Indiana Jones is like that, too, where you can watch Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade before you watch Temple of Doom, which actually takes place before Raiders of the Lost Ark. You're going to have a lot of fun with Indiana Jones because they made them like that. They made them to be these serialized mm-hmm. adventures. And Star Wars, I mean, it's like George Lucas wrote those movies, and he's like purposely telling you, do not watch this in order because we're going to release them like 16 years apart from when you're supposed to see them. So go ahead and see these movies. Then we'll tell the backstory later. I think you can see Star Trek II Wrath of Khan before you see... The motion picture, Stairfest. Yeah, like two, three, and four all yeah. work together. The rest of them you can interchange. Yeah. James Bond is the quintessential oh, one, one where you're like, yeah. you could just like, you could blindly go any, meeny. Yeah, I'm watching that one, and you're perfectly fine. You dropped you the torpedo name. right there. Yeah. That was a, yeah. All of a sudden you yeah. were like, oh, I got the George Lazenby one. <laughs> Damn it. You guys yeah. all picked the most iconic film franchises ever, and I'm like, Final Destination. I really do <laughs> love that franchise, wrong. though. The well, fr- I'm a little wrong. The more I thought about it, the more I realized I'm a little wrong in picking that. But still, go watch Final Destination because I love them. Soft. Wendy, what's next? <laughs> Danzig writes, uh, would you come back intermissions through a two and a half to three hour movie? It's good news for snacks and people's bladders. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the the Hateful Eight had an intermission for the one that I saw, and I thought yeah. it was actually pretty cool. I had like a, a, a prelude, it had, yeah. had the intermission. It was a really cool throwback to yeah. the films of old. I thought it was... I actually got a kick out of the shtick, so I'd bring it back for sure. I kind of liked it, too. My screening had the same mm-hmm. exact thing, and, you know, given that it's such a long movie, I think I needed that, but I really, my favorite part about how that one screened was the overture in the beginning. Yeah. That, yeah. Right. that, to me, made it feel like a real cinematic event. The only concern I would have with something like this is that some folks out there, because, you know, there are many people who don't want to see a three-hour-plus movie, so maybe they'll shy away from it if it's a super long experience versus, you know... Two, two and a half hours? I don't know. Ellis, what do you think? Yeah, it's not going to be for a blockbuster experience simply because, I mean, you even talk about the difference between a 90-minute running time movie and a movie that's two hours and ten minutes. That's a lifetime for theater owners because you can put so many more screenings in. If you add an intermission on top of an already long running time, that does not equal dollars, even if people are leaving to go buy more snacks. There's not that many people like me that will run through two large popcorns and need to go buy another one at the intermission. You called it popcorn. 
I call, yeah. I mean, I'll call a corn a popcorn sometimes. I just gotta <laughs> let the people know. I can't just throw corn at them every time. I love that I get to bring up this movie though, because it happens once a week on this show. The best intermission <laughs> in movie history: Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Oh, yeah. Such a funny point in that movie. God, that movie's great. I was gonna say Grindhouse also proved that people don't have that. You know, oh, what is it? Two and a half. It's almost three hours long, even though it's like. Dude, it's two other movies. It's these great filmmakers. Have some fun. I still am always boggled that no one went to go see that film. Um, I've seen tons of movies where it has uh, theatrical intermissions, Reds, a whole bunch of movies. And really, the world we live in now, it's very impatient, people. They just, you know. And you also have to deal with the box office, what you're talking about. You can't program. If a movie is two and a half hours with an intermission, Mm -hmm. then you can only program like six screenings as opposed to nine. And so those three screenings that every day from the opening weekend, people are, the theaters are losing out of, and that, that equals a lot of money if it's in 4,000 theaters. So you really can't do it anymore. So, you know, it's run at your own risk, but I think it's cool. There's also a creative challenge, too. It's like if that started to become a thing, writers and directors out there would have to find the moment where it worked. Because mm-hmm. you, could you imagine if, right, just because it's in the middle of the movie, it just stopped and it's, sucked the momentum out of everything? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's the reason why you should look, like, watch Monty Python and the Holy Grail, because that intermission comes at the worst possible time. <laughs> So you need to space your movie out and be like, oh, this is where we would do the intermission. It's a fun thing to do as, as a lark some night when that's your only thing going on that evening. Like if you go to the New Beverly in Hollywood, it's a fun, it's a fun movie theater, old-timey experience, and occasionally they'll throw intermissions in there. All right, Wendy, what's our next question? This one comes from Grey Jedi 28 who writes, only 14 episodes of Game of Thrones left, sad face. What would be the best setting for a film, and will it happen? Will it work? Huh. Hmm. I don't Ooh, think it's. Wow. I don't think it's going to happen. A film. A, a Game fi- of Thrones a film. film. I would. I would bet a lot of money. Not a predator costume, but I would bet <laughs> a lot of money that there's going to be a Game of Thrones film. I'll. Up. I'll make a bet with you right now. Let's do you. It. You pick film, and I pick some sort of you know sequel, prequel, or spinoff series. But okay. I think it'll exist if it keeps going beyond this immediate series on TV and not on the big screen. Gentlemen, what, what's the bet? Web series. No, I don't know. <laughs> I no oh, wh- how much money are you guys putting up? Hundred bucks. Uh, for just just wow. money? It should be like a dare. Yeah. You guys think I'm a money this. person. No, I'm gonna say it's a prequel series, like four epi- four two hour episodes on HBO, and it'll be a prequel series about you know one of the families, one but of the you think houses. It's, you think it's gonna be a series? Yeah, with, yeah. without a doubt, because that's they, then they can release those. They could have all four of them and do an Inhuman style thing and release them in IMAX. I love seeing Game of Thrones in the theater. I want to see Stranger Things season two, all eight episodes in the theater. Ooh. I think that would be really fun. And there you get your intermission every episode. You get to take a break. So, and you don't have to pay two dollars to use the bathroom. Exactly. Yeah. I think you guys should tell Perry and I what the bet is. I yeah. think it's going to be a Tweet movie. Uh, I think eventually you're going to get a movie. It might be a streamed movie somewhere or an HBO movie. But I think it's going to be a film. I think it's going to be a series. You guys tweet us. Let us know what the You had to put the call out. I feel like it's just going to be the most inappropriate dares now. Probably. <laughs> we don't Aww. accept inappropriate dares. The worst we'll do is wear a Nothing to do costume. with my hair, please. <laughs> but if I had to watch a movie, I'd like to see when uh, Rhaegar Targaryen, uh, or no, uh, it was uh, Ares Targaryen, the, the, not the Mad King, the, the, the initial one with the three dragons. Which mm. one was he? Was it Rhaegar? I can't remember his name. No, not Rhaegar. Prince Philip. Anyhow, not the Mad King, the dude before him. Mm-hmm. I'm going to get so corrected online. Yeah. This is going to suck but uh him with his dragons comes over and just takes over or i'd like to see uh the fight that the starks did and uh you know like with jamie lannister and the kingslayer mm. event and i would like to see that one of those two things i know we got flashbacks of that time period and uh, n- now i'm really like no it's definitely not rhaegar rhaegar is like the brother yeah he's, right? he's the brother yeah. um is Ares targaryen is uh, his name is a fan fangar yeah. yeah frizzlord Wendy, there's got to be commenters over there um, um, it's the well see the the live stream is like seconds behind so damn i'm it. waiting <laughs> damn it for it to catch up damn it while we wait for someone to answer that question how about another twitter question <laughs> sure this one comes from wade aiken who writes rumor is Zack snyder helped with action scenes for wonder woman might patty jenkins reciprocate with character bits for justice League. Hmm. I don't know. Schnapp, what do you think? Probably not. Aegon is the answer. A- oh, damn it! Aegon! I was like the thousand uh, blades of Aegon's enemies. I just totally was going to say Aegon decided not Glad to. Yeah, that was a great effort. That I want everybody on the internet to respect Jeremy for making a good effort. We don't have to nail the name pronunciation. If we made a solid effort, we deserve some kudos. We, we get You get participation awards on the internet, so I hear. <laughs> I would, uh, okay, well, what was the other question we were talking about? What do we got? I, um, Wendy, can you repeat that question? <laughs> oh, shoot. It's 
gone it, now. Was, it was oh, something about whether, Zack Snyder helping. Yeah, so a uh, rumor <laughs> is that Zack Snyder helped uh, with the Wonder Woman action scene, so might Patty Jenkins reciprocate for uh, Justice League? I would hope so. You know, I, I mean, I, I like having directors be able to give notes, especially if you all have to work in one shared universe together. I think it'd be really cool to not overtake the project. And I wouldn't want Zack Snyder to overtake Wonder Woman either. But just like, hey, here's my spin on this. You can give notes and you can be creative in a room together without letting ego get in the way. So I think it would be cool if you had Patty Jenkins or some or even a James Wan come in and say, like, hey, here's here's our notes for these characters who standalone movies we made. And hopefully they knock those out of the park. When you have these cinematic universes, that are creating interconnected movies and have a contingent of stellar directors, why, would, why wouldn't you want something like this to happen? That's the coolest kind of you know creative collaboration yeah. scenario you could possibly have. I hope that's how things are going down. Yeah, knowing all the directors are playing well in the sandbox is always good for the fans. It's always good for us to know that there's no conflict or turmoil when everyone's working together. It's just a lot more fun, and it makes for some good continuity. I think I answered it. No way. That's yeah. not happening. <laughs> well... On that note, that's all the time we got for you guys today. <laughs> thank you guys so much for watching the show. I want to thank everyone in the back. We've got Dennis, Adam, who just likes to cut to me when I'm not talking today. It's okay. <laughs> Forgive me, man. It's all good fun. Uh, we've got Riley and Cody back there, too. And then, of course, my great panel, John Schnepp. Where can everyone find you? You can find me, Kate, in his haircut. Oh, what? Ah, on Twitter and Instagram. With his John Schnepp, you can find it's me. It's very stripes, G.I. Jane. It's military. <laughs> it's not a bad haircut, dude. Don't worry about it. <laughs> What's going Talking on? about Cody's haircut. <laughs> this guy. Jeremy, where can everyone find you? Hey, uh, you can find me at Jeremy Jones on YouTube, Twitter, rest of the internet. You can find my show, Awesome Tacular, on Go90. It's a lot of fun, a lot of nerdy stuff, a lot of fun stuff. I really think you'll like it. You'll find me watching Power Rangers again because I want to see the sequel because that's probably going to be sweet. <laughs> hmm. And Mark Ellis? You can occasionally find me in the sidecar to Jeremy Jones' motorcycle on Awesome Tacular. Tonight, live, the Schmoes No Show is back 7 p.m. We have a special guest coming in at 8 o'clock. I think. And over at the other table, Ashimova, where can everyone find you? Thanks, Parami. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, <laughs> Snapchat, Ashimova. Happy Wednesday, guys. And Wendy. You can find me on YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, at Wendy Lee Zaney. And you guys can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at P. Nemiroff. There's Collider Behind the Scenes every Saturday. I'm going to the Power Rangers premiere tonight Yay. with Copster. Yay. He's back there. Oh, no, super excited. Ranger. The whole behind the scenes episode on Saturday is going to be about our experience there. So tune in, check that out. We're also going to try to Instagram and tweet and all that good stuff. So keep an eye on everyone's social media accounts. There's going to be lots of good stuff there. So that's it. I'm going to go turn my brain off and turn into Power Rangers mush. <laughs> See you next time. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.